Hello, this is Domenico with Easynomics, and we're going to continue our discussion of supply side policies. And in this case, we're looking at market based supply side policies, very different from interventionist supply side policies. Some historical examples of market based supply side policies was Ronald Reagan um, under during his uh, administration in the 1980s. Uh, his economic policies were referred to as Reaganomics where essentially he wanted the government, uh, he wanted less government intervention, basically have the government pull back from the economy, allow free market forces to take hold, to deregulate, and also to um, decrease government spending in terms of the provision of public goods and services, and instead have the free market and private firms provide those goods and services. Um, in addition, at the same time, Margaret Thatcher uh, used similar market-based supply side policies during her terms in office, um, and this was referred to as Thatcherism. And she also, uh, you know, uh, used techniques of privatization, basically selling state-owned enterprises into private hands, uh, having the government kind of pull back from the economy and allow the free market and private firms to uh, provide more and more goods and services into the economy. So let's take a few notes about what is market supply side policies. And we're just gonna briefly go over a few of these points in class. I'll go over them in more detail and perhaps in the future I'll create a, a video going into them in more detail. But just for now, I think we can group them into three categories. One is uh, government kind of pulling back and providing in an atmosphere within the economy that encourages competition. So encouraging greater competition between firms, which leads to uh, reduced prices, productive efficiency, uh, keeps inflation down, et cetera. There's more to it than just that. Another aspect, number two, is labor market reforms. And this could be the government making it easier to hire and fire labor. Um, in some socialist nations, it might be very costly for a firm to fire labor, so they maintain that labor. And because uh, workers may know that it's difficult for them to be fired, they may be uh, complacent and uh, not as productive, and productivity goes down. But if it's easier to hire and fire, then firms can fire unproductive um, employees and hire more productive, more innovative employees. And so the economy gets going. Right, and that's just part of uh, labor market, but just to give you an idea. And the other part is incentive related policies. All right, providing incentives for firms or for households to work and uh, earn money, uh, which they can later spend. So that might include perhaps uh, reducing corporate taxes or income taxes. If you are um, facing lower income or corporate taxes, perhaps you're incentivized to work more because you get to keep more of that money. So those are the general ideas behind that. Um, to elaborate a little bit more about encouraging competition, that it could include privatization. All right, Margaret Thatcher definitely did that. Privatizing state-owned enterprises. All right, so um, electrical companies, perhaps uh, railroad companies that were run by the government, water companies that were run by the government, telecommunication companies that were run by the government, at this point were sold into private hands with the idea being that a profit-driven uh, business owner would uh, operate them more efficiently. Also deregulation, so the government is going to kind of pull back their rules and regulations on firms, give them greater freedom, allow more of a free market to operate so that firms can uh, be very, very productive. It can also include private financing of public sector projects, uh, contracting out to the private sector. And so instead of the government doing something, have a private firm to do that. So perhaps they want to build a, uh, an expressway, they have a firm do it. So it becomes a private toll road so the private firm can benefit from it. Um, also in here, it includes restricting monopoly power. 
So the government being proactive in uh, preventing mergers that would give a, uh, two firms too much market power. So restricting monopoly power to encourage competition. And free trade, also under this category, trade liberalization or free trade. Free trade allows more foreign companies to come into the domestic economy and to compete, thus creating more competition. And it forces firms to innovate and keep their costs down to be productively efficient. Labor market reforms, uh, reforms may include abolishing minim minimum wage, So firms can employ labor at a lower wage, uh, weakening the power of labor unions, which Margaret Thatcher um, was infamous for in the 1980s. In addition, under labor market reforms, it may include reducing unemployment benefits that firms are not required to provide so many um, or uh, uh, benefits to their employees when they potentially fire them, or the government providing less uh, unemployment benefits to those who are unemployed. So reducing unemployment benefits. And the idea here is, in terms of the government reducing the unemployment benefits, that let's say, for example, you could collect uh, unemployment for two years, and the government reduces it to six months that may uh, incentivize people to quickly look for their next job as opposed to um, just waiting two years until they start looking for another job. And also reducing job security, basically meaning making it easier for firms to hire and fire. Reducing job security. And since uh, you may know that it's easy to be fired, you might be more productive um, at the firm that you're working at. So those are some of the ideas behind supply side interventionist um, and incentive related policies looks at perhaps lowering as i mentioned before lowering income tax so households are incentivized to work more because they can keep more of their income lowering cor corporate taxes etc uh, perhaps even lowering capital gains tax so overall, we can see um, that some of these might be unpopular with uh, the majority of people in a population. And as a result, Margaret Thatcher, um, you know, was, was really, uh, you know, faced a, a tough crowd as she tried to implement these policies. So what's the impact in a uh, model? How can we illustrate what the potential impact of this is on a macro economy? All right, so let's go ahead and illustrate this. So we're going to illustrate, um, in the short run, a downward sloping aggregate demand curve. We'll label that 81. And we have an upward sloping short run aggregate supply curve. Labeled SRS1. And the intersection of 81 at SRS1 provides an equilibrium price level at, all right, that we're going to illustrate in just a second at PL1 and the equilibrium level of GDP at Y1. Okay, And in the next graph, let's label this graph B, this is looking at the long run. What's the long run impact of these policies? Graph B, long run. So we'll have our LRES curve right here, illustrating full employment of our resources. And that provides us with a finite amount of output or potential GDP at YP1. So market-based policies, uh, if we were to uh, reduce in, uh, income and corporate taxes as an incentive-based policy, or if we were to allow firms to not provide so many uh, benefits to their employees, um, if we have we began to privatize 
state-owned enterprises where profit-driven entrepreneurs are trying to reduce their costs, etc., we would expect that the SRAS curve would shift out, right? SRAS shifting out due to firms reducing costs, aggressively reducing costs, right? So SRAS shifts out from SRAS 1 to SRAS 2. Uh, firms firing uh, unproductive labor, uh, firing labor that is uh, in excess that they don't need, um, competition between firms, forcing firms to keep their costs down as low as possible, trade liberalization, allowing more foreign firms to compete with domestic firms, which forces domestic firms to keep their costs down, etc. That all has the effect of reducing the SRES curve. So here we see a degree of deflation. That sets a new price level at PL2. Price level is falling. So lower inflation in the economy, or in this case, deflation. But at the same time, we see greater output. Firms are more productive with uh, less resources, using their resources more efficiently, more productively efficient. And we see an increase in real GDP as a result. And as a result of the, the price level falling, we see an increase in the quantity of aggregate demand. Households consuming more because prices on average are falling, thus they can afford to consume more, right? So this is very different from the interventionist supply side policy. Here we have deflation, but also a rise in real GDP. What is the impact in the long run? Well, in the short run, these cost-effective measures that private firms are employing will lead to greater output, greater potential output in the long run because uh, labor is much more productively efficient. Um, they're, we're getting more units of output, output per unit of time. Firms are innovating. They're using new technologies to increase their productivity, to lower prices, increase the quantity of aggregate demand, et cetera. So LRAS in the long run shifts out from LRAS 1 to LRS 2. And thus we have achieved the goal of supply side, which is to increase the LRS curve, to increase the potential GDP from LRS 1 to LRS 2, potential GDP increasing. Okay, so it shifts out and SRS also shifts out. So let's go ahead and illustrate, uh, analyze this as we would for paper one exam. As can be seen, we have two graphs illustrating market-based supply-side policies. In graph A, we're looking at the short-run impacts of these policies, and in graph B, we're looking at the long-run impacts of these policies. In both graphs, we're measuring real GDP on the x-axis and the price level on the y-axis. Graph A, we have a downward-sloping aggregate demand curve labeled 81 in accordance to the wealth effect, the international trade effect, and the interest rate effect. We have two upward-sloping SRES curves, Upward sloping because as the price level rises, it incentivizes firms to increase the quantity of their output. And in graph B, we have two perfectly inelastic LRAS curves. Perfectly inelastic because when we fully employ all of our factors of production, this is the most amount of output that the economy can achieve. In graph A, where SRS1 equals 81 at point A, providing an equilibrium price level at PL1 and real GDP at Y1, this corresponds to the potential GDP of LRS1. Full employment of resources provides full employment and the most amount of output that can be produced at YP1. The government begins to uh, in, implement market-based policies where they're going to encourage competition and or uh, use lab, labor market reforms and or use incentive-related policies to get uh, reduced costs of production in the short run, which would translate to LRS shifting out. These can include, in terms of encouraging competition, privatization, privatizing state-owned enterprises, deregulation, uh, allowing more of the free market to operate, giving more freedom to firms to uh, do as they like. Um, could also include free trade, more competition from foreign firms operating within the domestic economy. Labor market reforms could include abolishing minimum wage, which would reduce costs to firms. They can pay a lower wage for lower skilled workers, uh, weakening the power of labor unions that could achieve 
reduce benefits that firms are providing to their workers, thus again, reducing costs, reducing unemployment benefits from the government, uh, reducing job security, making it easier for firms to hire and fire, and with incentive related policies, uh, lowering income taxes or corporate taxes, et cetera. So all of this would have the effect of shifting SRES out from SRS 1 to SRS 2. And where SRS 2 equals 81 at point B, we see deflation. The price level falls from PL1 to PL2, and we see an increase in real GDP because as a result of the fall in the price level, there's an increase in the quantity of aggregate demand. Households are consuming more because goods and services are cheaper to, uh, to buy. Now, these cost-effective measures being implemented in the short run will also translate in the long run that the economy is more productively efficient, producing more output with less units of resources. So LRS shifts out from LRS1 to LRS2. The potential GDP increases from YP1 to YP2. And that's it. That's how we would graph and analyze a market-based supply-side policy. If you have any questions, feel free to comment, and don't forget to subscribe and to like. Thank you so much.